Welcome to Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, the only podcast you'll ever need to explore the ever-expanding world of medical oncology. Today, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Michael, and we have a special guest, Ash Malala Sakera. Now, Ash, for those who don't know who she is, is a medical oncologist and early career clinician, researcher based in Sydney and Southwest Sydney local health districts. She has over a dozen years of experience specializing in patient diagnosed with breast gynecological, colorectal and lung cancer, but her passion is survivorship. So today we welcome Ash to our show to talk to us all about survivorship, her passions and how we can improve the quality of life for our patients. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Ash. Thank you for having me, Josh, Michael. It's a pleasure. We very much look forward to hearing a slightly different uh, aspect of oncology and one that we haven't focused on too much. But Ash, let's start with let's start with you, as we always do with these uh, with these uh, special guest interviews. Can you tell us a bit about your journey to medicine and what actually led you to medical oncology? Yeah, nice um, broad canvas. Yeah, that's right. Going back a while, um, I guess uh, the first um, sort of. Uh, a uh, fork in the path towards medicine was from my high school biology teacher um, who uh, recommended a career in medicine. Um, I really enjoyed human biology and physiology. And uh, I think in our um, culture, there's, you know, a few sort of top three top three options <laughs> that uh, that were recommended. Um, and so I, I don't have any anyone medical in my uh, my family. Um, and so it was uh, it was a little bit of a, a new pathway, but uh, but that was uh, that it's it's I haven't looked back since then. Um, I did undergrad at, uh, in Sydney Uni um, and that was in well I started off in science law. And then dropped the law when I realised how many uh, books I had to read. <laughs> so of course, naturally, with um, science and medicine, <laughs> there was uh, uh, a little bit more practical application. I I um, I de- I majored in human physiology, and that was uh, that was probably the start of what was to come. Um, and uh, and then. Uh, Got into med school, and in med school, I did an honors project in urology, which I really enjoy. But to be very sort of uh, frank, I didn't want to be a doctor of just down there, you know, of the nether parts. I wanted to be an overall physician and diagnostician, someone who sort of was, um, uh, whose sort of practical day job required being in touch with all organs of the body as well as the person. Uh, so it ended up being more about the type of doctor I wanted to be rather than the type of pathology I wanted to study. Um, and the second sort of the main reason I went into medical oncology and wanted to be a medical oncologist was because I looked and spent, well, I observed a lot of doctors while I was training. And uh, I I was looking particularly for those doctors who were well-balanced had lives, um, seemed genuinely content and treated everyone, mostly everyone, pretty well, uh, especially when no one was looking. And it seemed that there were more medical oncologists who fit that description. So, um, so yes, I'm happy to say that that's how uh, uh, this, this lifestyle or this profession um, came about. And, yeah, haven't looked back since then. Yeah. That, that's that's amazing, Ash. I love how you just dropped dropped in the law. So you got into two or two of the hardest, I guess, um, professions known known to Australians to get into. And you're like, I'll do, I'll just choose the other one. But it sounds like so far you've made a great choice. You got into medical oncology, and you've obviously flown through that. And then you've you've looked in. I guess with our listeners, medical oncology is a vast discipline with lots of subspecialties as well. Yeah. And you were talking about being a physician of the whole person, but how did, I guess, first of all, did you want to explain to our listeners what survivorship is yeah. and how you got interested in this area? Yeah. So this is actually uh, an area that I was working in while concurrently doing a PhD. 
in a separate area altogether. My PhD was in lung cancer, health services research and patterns of care. And, um, you know, that's a different podcast and research area altogether. Uh, but I was logging and doing uh, and started working in uh, at the Sydney Cancer Survivorship Centre at Concord Hospital. Um, so I've been there for more than oh, – for about 10 years now. Um, and that work – and that team uh, and the work culture is uh, is what sort of incited the passion. Uh, so survivorship is I, is a very contentious term. There's there's uh, different affinities and feelings about the word uh, or the phrase cancer survivorship. That, that's a separate conversation, uh, and I think we don't have the answer yet. Um, the the term has been around for like more than. 20 years. It's been described for, for, for a while. And the definitions um, have also been beautifully described. Probably more than 15 years ago, the critical components of survivorship care were described. And they still hold true today. I think that's what's more important, the components of survivorship care. A person is considered a cancer survivor from the point of diagnosis for the remainder of their life. So that includes anyone with a diagnosis, no matter what the stage, no matter what their age. And we've got 19 million cancer survivors by that definition um, in the world. And, you know, two thirds of those uh, would be living with long term um, or living in the long term with advanced cancer um, because of improved survival rates. So. That's 19 million different stories. Each person will have, at any one point in time, a different story and experience. Um, I always say the, the, the definition of a cancer survivor is more a definition for you and me as health professionals to recognize that this person requires supportive care from the point of diagnosis. And that's what thankfully is you know over the last 20 years has has been uh, occurring um, the provision of services from the point of diagnosis is now thought about and um, and attempts are made to bring those uh, supportive care services up front to the patient um, the the components of survivorship the ones um, the what entails survivorship um, they they involve uh, essentially, it's about anticipation. It's about um, screening and anticipating complications of cancer and its treatment. So that's like not just screening for residual side effects, but also um, anticipating risks of long-term effects of cancer. And again, not just physical, but also the psychosocial, cognitive uh, emotional, functional um, components of life. And um, it's not just about, you know, um, anticipating a second, uh, a risk of a second malignancy, for example. It's also looking at the uh, commonly or well-described clusters of issues that exist. For example, the sort of um, um, cluster of uh, side effects of breast cancer treatment arthralgias, hot flushes, mood disturbance, um, and, uh, and secondly, you know, the cluster of anxiety, anxiety, fear of recurrence, fear of progression. Um, so really sort of, you know, looking for those clusters, screening for one of those issues in the clusters, and then um, managing the, the, um, the impact of that and addressing it, the, the issue uh, keeping in mind, you know, what else is associated with that issue. Does that make sense? It's sort of um, um, really kind of taking a definition and uh, taking that established guidelines and putting them into practice. I do always try and highlight whenever I'm sort of presenting on this issue or speaking to patients in clinic is uh, the role of the caregiver. There's often, as, as we, you, you, you both know, there's always someone else in the room um, who's quietly observing and taking on a lot and trying to shoulder the burden of the diagnosis. Um, so a caregiver is very much feature in that definition um, in terms of looking after carers of people with cancer and their unmet needs. 
Uh, there's also a lot you can tell about a person if there is no care in the room. Um, that's that's something that uh, should be considered. The other huge domain of cancer survivorship care is coordination. Coordination with family doctor, the family doctors, coordination with other specialists, um, um, and uh, and allied health professionals who could provide uh, services for the particular unmet needs of, of that person. So a true holistic approach to care yeah. in, in, in the most literal sense of the exactly. word. Exactly. It's, it's actually, you know, um, really uh, um, consistent with, with holistic care. Which is nowadays a, a word that is, is bandied around potentially uh, inaccurately, yeah. but the, the description you've given, Ash, is one that really does embody that word, holistic. Yeah. There's a lot of components there, and I guess to break it down, in your experience, what would you think is the most challenging part of taking a holistic survivorship approach to cancer? Do you change your approach based on the, I guess, expected prognosis? Obviously, we don't need to tell you someone with advanced lung cancer or pancreatic cancer is for the same burden of disease, probably not going to have as good a prognosis as someone with breast cancer or melanoma or prostate cancer. So do you change your focus and your approach based on a patient's expected oh, prognosis? Oh, right. I see. I see. Oh, good question. I haven't been asked that. I think you have to acknowledge it and change it to serve the uh, unmet needs of that uh, person uh, within context of their population. So there is now a well-known dis, um, well-known subgroup of metavirus or people living with advanced cancer, treatable but a, a advanced cancer. And, um, you, you know, once again, it took uh, a doctor um, to go through advanced cancer to come up with and raise awareness of this issue. It's, it's pretty sad, actually, even like, you know, survivorship itself came to light because a doctor went through it and that, that makes me feel sad that, you know, we, <laughs> there's lots of people who weren't doctors who went through it. And, um, and, uh, and it wasn't until we go through it, we realize that these, these populations exist. So, so um, we, we had actually, there was a recent um, um, systematic review that looked at unmet needs of people with, uh, with advanced cancer. And, um, uh, be, I think you have to use those sorts of studies to inform your approach to people who have a different prognosis compared to people with advanced, uh, sorry, with early, treated for early stage cancer. The top four domains of people, um, of unmet need in people and their carers with uh, dealing with advanced cancer are financial, um, psychosocial, um, health system and navigation, unmet information needs, more than actual uh, physical um, needs and getting through daily activities. So you can see that there it's, it's this very uh, sobering um, uh, sort of cluster of problems that these people are facing and that have, you know, almost the, their actual well-being and their actual prognosis is, and their physical sort of uh, symptom burden is low on the list of what's worrying them. So, um, so it's about sort of uh, recognizing that there's a different set of problems that these people that these people face. Um, and yes, their prognosis plays a role in the huge issue that is fear of of, of uh, progression and uncertainty, and living with that uncertainty. Uh, so, so in in finally, in sort of to answer your question, you have to acknowledge the prognosis if and and key that in to discussions if if patients want to talk about it. So you know, it doesn't change. Um, it shouldn't change the fact that we still still offer and screen um, and. Uh, provide supportive care and survivorship services to people who have been diagnosed with cancer, early stage or advanced. Does that answer your question? 
It, I think it does, but I, I might. I'll. I'm going to answer for Michael. Yes, I think he was. He was nodding. <laughs> as, oh, okay. As you, you raised a constellation of really interesting points just from that study when you talk about the unmet needs of the individual and their support circle or carer. Yeah. And one thing I find is the biomedical model in medicine is a very strong influence on lots of our practice. And I think traditional methods of engaging with patients doesn't confer to the ability to sit down and work yeah. through these yeah. different, I guess, subdomains. What's your approach seeing someone in a general clinic, which I'm assuming you probably have a hundred patients sort of sitting there waiting to see you, slight exaggeration. Yep. How do you screen for such a, I guess, a vast list of potential challenges that your patient might face and a- approach this? Therein lies the issue. Resources. <laughs> Resources. Um, you know, t- what is it? 20 minutes for a formal consultation, a follow-up consultation. Yeah, yeah, 40 minutes for new patients. Um, Time is of the essence and and is the predominant barrier to to providing guideline-based survivorship care. Um, There are tools that... um, we use in my general oncology clinic where, you know, I look after people with breast, lung and gynae cancers. Um, there are um, the the use of pre-collected patient reported outcome measures is uh, of huge value to me um, and other clinicians in terms of triaging what the uh, acute problem may be um, and whether that's related to cancer treatment or something completely different you know it's so those pre-collected longitudinally um, collected uh, outcome measures really do assist now whether they ever get out whether they're completed whether they you know whether collection is as long as we want that's uh, that's that is an an issue it should be done I think you know we we need those tools um, and we need to build in research capacity into these cl- into our clinics in order to assess you know what what differences we're making to the lives of people undergoing cancer treatment um, the other um, the other of course uh, important sort of um, resource to identify what's affecting people at the time are um, working as a team we cannot we cannot work in isolation um, if we get a message or an email or a post-it note from a member of the team about a, a message that was left um, or a particular problem that one of the team noticed in the chemo suite or um, an email from our um, occupational therapist saying this issue came up in there in with this patient. That's another flag, you know, recognising when a colleague identifies a concern um, and then sort of... T- making sure that that links into your clinic. Um, So I think, you know, those sorts of um, uh, formal and informal uh, uh, communication channels can help um, unpack whether a person is indeed going through financial distress or um, unmet information needs that we can help address in our clinic. Um, or um, uh, or a physical symptom or side effect um, that we can um, improve upon in clinic. Yeah, it's it's I can't do it all the time. Somebody I worked with um, once said very wisely, "It's impossible to to tick all those boxes." Me, you know, uh, adhere to all those components of care in one clinic visit. You, you know me, Josh. Like you know, you know, how we work together, and it was nigh impossible. Um, but uh, it still doesn't mean we should, should shouldn't try. As you mentioned in that last sort of um, statement about 
uh, both resources being a major issue as well as, um, you know, not being able to work alone. Obviously, every patient, because you've spoken also about tailoring your modes of care to the needs of the patient, so every patient will be slightly different. But in general, can you give us a sense of what sort of resources and and, and what sort of uh, team members you work with to... If you, if you only had one patient, you know, we've gone from 100 down to one now. Um, if you only had one patient um, and you were going to sort of assemble a team to help that one patient, what sort of things would, what, what sort of specialist, subspecialist allied health, what, who would be involved and who would you be sort of, I guess, coordinating as the person who's driving the show? Yeah, great question. And I'm happy to report that we, I have been in that situation. We have a, a multidisciplinary survivorship clinic for uh, every new uh, patient referred to us. So at Concord, that's just our standard of care. Um, every person who's completed curative definitive treatment for early stage cancer gets referred to this clinic. Um, and uh, and yes, I acknowledge, you know, we we haven't the resources to provide it to people with advanced cancer yet, but uh, but in that new clinic um, and from that experience, we have some data to show that this improves patients' experience and outcomes. That new clinic is uh, um, what it used to be face to face. Now it's online, and it's attended by the patient, their next of kin, and interpreter if required, a medical oncologist or a hematologist, a dietitian, a clinical psychologist, exercise physiologist, a specialised nurse. It's a, it's a multidisciplinary clinic. Before the clinic, patients are sent a questionnaire list of um, a package of patient reported outcomes to capture their current symptom burden as well as um, exercise measures, dietary history, uh, measures of quality of life, and um, it the they're required to complete that set of questionnaires before coming to the clinic. Fifteen min- minutes before the clinic, there is a MDT where we go through those their answers and correlate that to their medical history, uh, and essentially each person in that team then meets with the patient and their carer and uh, gives them a one-to-one assessment um so it's it's wonderful you know that description having that um that resource um 98 percent of patients in our uh our, our, um, our publication looking at this clinic were found it worthwhile attending it and uh, a similar proportion would recommend it to others um, they sort of often say it would have been good to have it even sooner into their diagnosis uh, and their survivorship course. But, um, and that's, I suppose, you know, something we've taken away to try and, uh, you know, ensure patients newly diagnosed access, clean psych um, support or exercise programs. But, but that's the feedback we've got from that clinic. If we could improve it further, I would... Um, um, sort of also involve uh, perhaps a social worker uh, as well um, or per- or even someone sort of akin to a liaison officer um, to assist with financial planning and management in that first clinic. Always helpful for patients of uh, different ethnicities, um, or minority populations to have um, a cultural support officer uh, or liaison officer present. Um, yes, and I suppose you, you've you got to, you know, get that. Uh, it's about correlating the history, providing um, everyone possible and available at the start and then working on which needs are most acute or which needs are probably, you know, going to rise as time goes by uh, and then tailoring it from there on. This reminds me of one of the phrases we use very often in the show, which is precision oncology or precision medicine. What you've essentially described is really precision holistic care, incorporating every aspect of healthcare and realizing that us 
being the doctors and not the center of the universe. I know. <laughs> I know it, it's hard, but I, I can take it on just just this once. No, but my, my question is, is this: is that moving on in your your I guess your model of care when it comes to this um, survivorship clinic? Yeah, is there a role of including a family physician or a general practitioner oh, for an ongoing yeah. kind of integration? Because you know, healthcare and hospitals can only provide so much, and just utilizing that would you mind elaborating potentially my goodness yes and so this comes back to you know uh the component number six of the um institute of medicine report that that seminal report from 2006 um coordination with the primary care uh practitioner um is paramount from the beginning involving and ensuring that the role of a person's um, general practitioner is highlighted um, from the beginning. And, and, you know, we know this doesn't often happen because we become the uh, primary, you know, physician when a person is diagnosed with cancer. They logistically and, and you know, physically cannot see their GP um, as often as they would like and, to be honest, sometimes the issues are better sort of um, managed or better treated and recognised and can be managed feasibly by by uh, cancer physicians. Um, so my day-to-day sort of job at Concord right now is running the follow-up, the survivorship follow-up clinic. So 40% of our patients who come to the new clinic then follow up with myself and um, uh, my our nurse practitioner, our survivorship nurse practitioner, Kim, and it's a shared clinic. And so we look after these patients for, you know, the next uh, five years. Um, we take over. It's a standard of care for us to take over from their treating medical oncologists. And that is, uh, I, I'm not kidding, probably nine times out of ten I'm saying in that clinic, who is your GP? What are their contact details? I will write to them and delineate when I will next see you, what investigations I will do, and what I would like their help with. So that is um, very much part of that job. Because, you know, guess what? The predominant um, sort of comorbidity um, or uh, if, you know, a well-recognized cause of mortality in cancer, people who's, who um, who complete treatment for curative, you know, with curative intent is uh, cardiovascular disease. So I need I need the help of my colleagues in, uh, in general practice um, to assist with screening and management of cardiovascular risk factors, but also, you know, other comorbidities, common comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, those uh, those conditions. Um, GPs are the experts in screening and management. So um, I cannot um, emphasize how important our GPs are and what a precious resource they are now more than ever. They're so valid. I, I actually, one thing I actually do is I address my letters to the GPs. I know it starts off from the referring medical oncologist, but they inevitably are CC'd in the end. I'm writing to the GP. We know from the data that follow-up care models um, uh, in GP-led care um, show that, you know, there's there's uh, uh, great sort of satisfaction and um, um patient rapport with GPs there's there's uh there's it's it's cheaper to the health system in in one systematic review that GPs lead this sort of uh survivorship care however in my case I think um, I want to sort of you know really work in in a sort of shared care model and um and uh, uh delineate clearly what I can do and what I trust and know that they will do for the patient We've talked a little bit, Ash, about patients with advanced cancer and obviously, and and very unfortunately, it is the nature of the beast that you will probably be seeing them fairly regularly and increasingly regularly for the rest of of their lives. But what about the post-cancer space uh, for patients with 
early breast cancer who do, in the full meaning of the word, survive cancer. Mm -hmm. Um, You mentioned, you know, deferring to GPs and their greater knowledge about um, hypertension, cardiovascular risk, that sort of thing. But how does your particular role shift uh, Mm. uh, taking the breast cancer example? You know, they've had their surgery, they may have had chemotherapy, and they're very well established on aromatase inhibitors where in a normal health setting you'd see them once a year, if that. How does your role sort of change uh, as time goes on? Yeah, so that sort of... um, so. Three days a week, I'm that person, you know, who's looking after a, uh, or consulting occasionally on a person on um, long-term endocrine therapy. Yeah, that's where it's it's sort of um, it's interesting because I often find myself bringing a lot of the survivorship experience and uh, lessons and recommendations into that clinic as well. So I do see them probably a little bit more often than a year. Um, and I try to be a little bit more proactive in terms of screening for some of the recognised sort of uh, uh, issues that crop up, depending on where they are in their trajectory from end of upfront treatment, whether they're within the first three years of starting endocrine therapy, five years, whether they're going to have long-term um, extended adjuvant therapy. There's actually sort of well-defined trajectories of where certain symptoms crop up more um, or certain symptoms dissipate over time. Um, so um, I I do like having the survivorship experience concurrently to be able to apply to those patients because um yeah at at yeah, where i work in the southwestern local health uh, local health district there's a lot of um we're we've, we're very privileged to have rich cultural diversity and there's um inequities um in terms of access to some of the standard health services let alone survivorship services. Thankfully, we've got a wellness centre now out there. We've got um, a growing uh, sort of uh, group of practitioners who assist with um, massage or acupuncture or um, sort of psychosocial support as well, cultural support. So those are all, you know, those are all part of survivorship care. And, uh, And I think if I can see them a little bit more frequently, um, and access these um, services in the public system. Yeah, so it's exciting. Very exciting, Ash, especially, you know, when you can see things built from the ground up to essentially a service that was dearth of really options for both clinicians and patients. Yes. That's just, yeah. I think that's it. It's every uh, doctor's dream to make an impact yeah. that meaningful. Ash, with their survivorship journey, anyone who's in, I guess, in the curative intent and you're following them up, with a lot of these patients, some of these medications will continue beyond the end of your journey with them, potentially. I'm talking about things like osteoporosis management and yeah. cardiovascular management. Do you find in your data that you might have known this patient for five or ten years and then at the end of the survivorship you're like, all right, I'll see you later, you can sort of be managed by your cheap he. That must be quite traumatizing and confronting yeah. for yeah. these people that look at us as essentially their umbrella, their safety umbrella. Yeah. How do you manage the the complexities of that um, in what is such a trauma driven experience for a lot of people? Yeah, I I'm sort of glad you brought up the word trauma because it really is it it. It uh, it is a traumatic experience that no one ever asked for. Like no one ever asked for it or anticipates a diagnosis like this. Um, this is a massive curveball. And when you talk to patients um, and their carers, um, and so in a way you have to address it in, as you would as you would a person who's got uh, who has post traumatic stress disorder. In a way, name it, talk about it, acknowledge that you know that from the point of diagnosis life is different and uh and yes nobody feels like a cancer survivor from the point of diagnosis even though they are but um but you it i find in my survivorship clinics like sitting down and sort of putting up 
um, the Clinical Oncology Society of Australia, the COSA, the model of survivorship care, up on the computer screen, and that's that's an, that's been such a helpful tool for me in the clinic to uh, contextualize and explain to the patient where they are in their journey and how there's this point at which upfront primary treatment is complete and then you know based on their underlying health literacy the complexity of their uh, current symptoms and what they're at risk for um, and how well they can manage themselves some of those issues um, create a plan on going for who they should follow up with how often and um, and for how long at Concord, I've had patients, particularly in the last, honestly, three months, we've had a few patients who've completed five years of care with us, surveillance and care. And, you know, a few of the times Kim and I have had a little tear in our eye, taken a few selfies, you know, with them. It's, um, they sort of can't believe that five years has passed because, you know, the amount that they've been through and then throw in like, you know, the events of, the world's plans in 2020, um, it's been massive for them over the last five years. Um, so so I try, before that five-year mark, I do try and, uh, we do try and ensure that they're linked in and integrated with community care, um, their GP, their specialists. Hopefully they do have somebody who's sort of seen to particular medical problems if they do have, uh, you know, severe osteoporosis or um, unstable heart disease or, you know, perhaps uh, heart disease where particular risk factors could be better medically optimised, um, psych, you know, psychosocial support. You'd hope that in our clinic we would have already linked them up to those services in order to be able to, um, you know, bid goodbye with confidence and happiness and um and hand over care. Um, so those are the patients, you know, who are well set up with community services and high degrees of uh, ability, self-efficacy and manage, self-management techniques. Uh, they're, they're the ones who we sort of shake hands and uh, firmly but definitively and, and, um, and discharge back. There are a few who have stayed with us and, and those are, uh, those are always a case by case um, basis, but the but there the reasons mirror the reasons we see in the wider data. Um, fragmented care in the community, multiple transitions between practitioners. The patient, you know, has moved to geographical locations, or um, and uh, the only constant has been has been us, or uh, the patient. Um, just has a sort of a slightly higher risk of recurrence than the average sort of population because perhaps they've had, you know, two cancers or a, a, a sort of a, a second primary um, for which, you know, we needed to restart the clock. So we kind of make the arrangements saying, all right, we will look after you for another, uh, say, two years, um, and uh, but on, on this proviso. Um, a practical aspect is that we have found that surveillance, you know, including radiological surveillance, is always best done at one practice where where we can review films. And if we have any concerns about new findings, we can discuss those as part of our multidisciplinary team who also have access to the films. <laughs> like, um, so the that's that's actually a real um, factor um, that comes into play. Uh, and that's part of the model as well to address fear of cancer recurrence, to ensure that there's a safe and effective way of radiologically surveying um, certain groups of people. Ash, uh, I want to come back to something that you mentioned slightly obliquely um, in passing to uh, towards the start of the episode and that's the other person in the room with the patient um which is obviously something that in the usual day-to-day practice i mean beyond sort of noting that there is someone yes in the room when you're sort of internalizing what sort of supports a patient have you don't really think about very much um what sort of 
focus do you have on on patients, family members and various supports? And I guess also relatedly, do you ever wade into sort of the genetic inheritance factors if there is um, a as yet unworked up potential predilection from that aspect? Yeah, yeah, great aspect. Great, uh, great question. So uh, second part of your question first, um, one component of survivorship care is screening um, for cancer-related syndromes. So absolutely, um, hereditary cancer syndromes um, are part of that definition. And, but the, the good news is that, um, you know, most patients are referred up earlier in their diagnosis to, um, our very helpful colleagues in genetic counseling and are screened and, um, and are given, you know, very comprehensive recommendations if they are found to have, uh, any, um, you know, mutagenic, um, causes. Um, but I do think, uh, uh, and I'm surprised I haven't seen much of this to my knowledge. I think, you know, any updates to your family history should be part of ongoing long-term follow-up. Um, it, it's, I, I ask it actively in our Concord Survivorship Follow-Up Clinic, um, but, uh, but I do wonder how often it is asked and updated because uh, we want to know, you know, if there's any new diagnoses in the family. Um, so, so to answer the first part of your question, um, carers, yes, if they're, they're in the room, that tells you a lot. If they're not, that tells you even more. And um, we, we know from people with advanced cancer carers uh, of uh, people with advanced solid tumours or hematological cancers, their top sort of uh, unmet needs are mainly informational um, needs, psychological uh, needs, and um, and sort of how to look after the patient and support them. They're automatically, you know, into how do I support this person? How do I... Um, how am I going to find out the information that this person needs? And you know, some of the um, in the in the data, the particular items that needed addressing were uh, knowing who to contact, like who is who is the person that we need to contact, and are the doctors talking to each other? Or am I going to have to do that? So uh, that's hard, right? And and I'm telling you and discussing all of this because I. No, I know that I can't, and I don't. I don't know if I'm doing it well myself as a doctor, but this is uh, this is something that's definitely up for more research. It's a research gap, and uh, and a focus of attention. Um, caregivers experience also um, probably unmeasured amounts of stress, and uh, um, I suppose we we need to acknowledge them and really recognize them. Um, a lot more, uh, and and uh, talk, uh, invite them into the room, you know, um, actively make sure that they're part of the room, um, that they are the ones who are looked, uh, uh, that they are also screened for um, for issues for which they can access uh, psycho psychological support or um, financial planning um, support. Ash. This is the most annoying part of our podcast, which is we have so many questions and only a limited amount of time. But I do have one final question for you, if that's okay. You've been, you know, you've, you've done, as an early career researcher and medical oncologist, you've already achieved phenomenal things. You're a bit too um, kind, Josh. But the question that we ask everyone who sits in this in this seat, well, you know, this virtual seat, I guess you could say, is that if you had the ability to talk to yourself when you started this journey, whether you're a junior doctor, a junior registrar, or just somewhere on your journey, what pearls of wisdom would you give yourself or people who are in a position similar to you? Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I haven't had enough time to reflect on that, isn't it? It's a hard question. <laughs> I reckon um, demanding more protected administrative time would be my biggest pearl of wisdom. It's very boring. <laughs> it's 
it's actually quite random, but I wish that um, that we I would have known more about you know how important having sit down and think time, admin time, time to actively look into not just professional admin but personal admin. So um, accessing financial planners, you know, um, accessing experts in research data management. Those are kind of the kinds of things that, you know, often get shelved or put aside. So, so that's sort of, you know, the, the biggest, most pressing kind of uh, uh, thing of value to me. Um, I always, uh, I think that's because I'm already blessed and always have been blessed with a wonderful sort of family and husband <laughs> and uh, who has been a massive support and, and essentially like run the ship, you know, everything from home to family. Um, he's an ace at that. And I, that's, that's, that's uh, a privilege. So, you know, if not for him, like my professional life would not have, you know, progressed. And there's, look, Josh, you're a bit too kind. Like there's, there's a lot I haven't done and I, there's a pile of stuff that you can't see <laughs> here that I haven't got to. Um, but, you know, it, I'm amazed at you all. I'm amazed that, you know, you, you're doing something like this um, on the side. So I'm, I'm really proud that, you know, I've had such wonderful support at home and also, of course, a wonderful um, work culture at the hospitals I've worked at. A very philosophical uh, point to end, Ash. Look, thank you so much for... I, I, <laughs> I must find out the answers to your previous previous uh, guests <laughs> whether anyone you'd be surprised yeah. a, a lot of them say much the same thing you know focus on what's important is is the overarching theme for a lot of what our guests have said but look thank you so much for for taking some time out of your incredibly busy multi-talented schedule um it's been absolute an absolutely fascinating um a uh, peek into an area of oncology that I don't think many of our listeners will even know existed. Um, so it is uh, very, very valuable, and we're very, very thankful for you uh, spending some time with us. No, I'm grateful. Thank you guys for doing this podcast. Really, really well done. Can't wait to to support it more. Spread the word. You're far too kind. Thank you so much. Join us next time on Oncology for the Inquisitive Mind, where we will be beginning another one of our epic voyages. This is a voyage into the management of non-EGFR mutant, but otherwise mutant, non-small cell lung cancer. We've done an episode on EGFR mutations, but there is so many more mutations to explore. So join us over the next few weeks, where we will commence our voyage on the Nautilus 20,000 leagues under the lung cancer. Wow. We hope to see you then. <laughs> you guys are such professionals. <laughs> Good job, I thought that was, that was great. <laughs>